Good evening, everyone. So today's class, I will be discussing about anticipation. So first, let me talk the, the anticipation in the field of neurobiology. So in neurobiology science, there is one phenomenon called as phantom limb. So this phantom limb is a sensation that an amputated or missing limb is still attached to the body and is moving appropriately with other body parts. So the, am the amputee does not have the limb, but he is feeling that limb, so this is called a phantom limb. And if you just feel the limb, it's not a big deal, but if you're starting feeling pain, or if you think that your limb is crooked in a very uncomfortable way, then it's a, a problem for them. So, um, Dr. Ramachandran, he wrote in his group, and he suggested a theory that this phenomenon arises is because of uh, the several process in our brain. So when when we try to move our limb, our motor cortex will send a command to the hand to move the limb and to the brain. So at the same time, it sends to the hand and to the brain. So the brain, when they receive the command they would anticipate the stimulus from the hand. But because the limb is amputated, so they receive non-stimulus from the hand, and it results in the motor command would override the brain and making the brain think that the hand is moving. So this is the anticipation in the field of neurobiology, and let's move to the psychology part. And I found this article is from the Ulrich Nicer, is that correct? Perceiving, anticipating, and imagining. So in this article, Ulrich suggested that the same processes underlie both perceiving and imagining. So, but we don't confuse between perceiving and imagining because they are different. Different, even though they use the same process. So let's look at the perception first. He says that the traditional model for the perception use this model, information processing model. So according to this model, the perception is a passive process where the sensory input comes from the left-hand side and then they undergo a lot of processing and, and then it gives the consciousness, it gives the perceptions. But Ulrich doesn't agree with this model and he claims that perception is actually a continuous process. He says that perception is a constructive process that involves anticipation and involves the construction of a plan to obtain more information. So the perceiver they in anticipate certain information to be, to be available and they get ready to accept it. And oftentimes they explore they explore to obtain the new information. And he also says that perception is not restricted to a single sensory system. The perception could involve multimodal sensory. So for example, when a baby heard a sound from the opposite direction, the baby would turn away to, the, to that direction. It's because when he heard something, he perceived there is something behind and he wants to see, so he turns his head. And another example is we look at someone who is speaking. So because the lip movement supports the listening. And also in this main, the lip movement supports the subtitle. So we can see that we use multimodal sensory in perception. So in perception, anticipation is a major process. And it helps us in tracking a trombone. So for example, this is a low quality GIF, but we can track the tennis ball is because we know that when the right side hits the ball, we can anticipate the ball at the left side, coming back and forward. And the anticipation also helps us in selectively paying attention to particular object. So when we focus on the tennis ball, then we don't see that there is one Pokemon here. Right. So, because we are paying attention on the ball by anticipating <laughs> attention, so we don't see that the Pokemon is in the scene. Do you see that the scene? Yes. Do you see that 
No, I don't see. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> and also, the anticipations help us in perceiving the gap. So when we see something, we don't just see it. We track it along some period. So for example, the mountain is moving slow, slower than this bush in front of you. So we can know that the mountain is further away compared with the bush. But Ulrich also says that many people have misunderstanding about this claim. So they say that if we anticipate one thing, but we see another thing, would we miss it? So he says that no, we, we won't miss it because we cannot perceive unless we anticipate, but we must not only see what we anticipate. Because he says that perception does not merely confirm the pre-existing assumptions, at the same time it also acquires new information. And the new information would help the perceivers to correct his anticipation. So anticipation is like a function of a structure that we call schemata. So schemata is a plan for obtaining more information. But I, so I think schema, schemata is also like a cognitive map. Is it correct? Yeah, and when we perceive something, the schemata will change with the new information input. And he says that schemata does not only construct the plan, it executes the plan as well. So for example, let's check the color of the clock on the wall behind in the room. Why didn't you guys check the wall? No, there's no clock there. But you know there is no clock? Yeah. But I assume you guys would turn no. around. But I think this is just a game. Actually, I expect you guys would go turn around and check the clock. But you guys give me no response. But actually, I assume that when we, we, we would see behind, turn behind, because we expect a clock there. But if there is no clock, then we would see around. And, and so this is what... You will see a clock also even if there is not there? No, I see a lamp and a board. I'm sorry? <laughs> I see a lamp and a board. It's that if we check, we expect a clock behind, but if we see that there is no clock, it is, we would turn to from, find it. Yeah, to find it. We want to find it. So this is perception, the successive phases followed by one another, rapidly and often unaware. So it's like, we expect a clock, we turn to see it, but we can't find a clock. So we turn around to explore based the clock. I guess it's uh, the same as one test. Uh, it's like a joke. They say you can't count your teeth with your tongue. So, so everybody would stop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we don't anticipate. Oh, maybe before. Yeah. You know, we say, oh, your forehand is dirty. Oh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I know there's one that you can't touch your nose with your tongue. And people will try that. Yeah. <laughs> so the difference between perception and mental imagery is that perception occurs very rapidly and we are unaware of them. But when we imagine something, we are in a state of prolonged period during which we anticipate objects that have not yet appeared. So to clearly show that, let's imagine walking from this room to Union Market. So I know you guys are familiar with the environment, so you know the road. So when you imagine walking, you, you construct a plan. So the plan is the road from here to Union Market, and you anticipate the things that you see along the road. But even you construct a plan, you don't execute it because you are in a class. So you are in a state of active but unfulfilled expectations. So this state is we call imagining, mental imagery. That's why we can differentiate between the perception and the mental imagery. And it also says that the role of anticipation is imagery and it can act helps in mnemonic, mnemonic device. Like the memory palace, we imagine a palace and then we imagine we put something in 
a certain room. So that when we imagine that, imagine we ourselves to walk into that room, we would retrieve those things. We anticipate the things that we store in that room would be at there as well. And anticipations also help facilitate rapid perception of imagined object. If so, the Ulrich he conducted an experiment, he, and he found that if we ask something to prepare for something, imagine something, and prepare, they will respond quickly. And the anticipations also direct anticipatory behavior. So let's say if we imagine a tennis match, then our head and our eyes would move according to the ball, even though we just imagine and we don't see it. So I think the movement would be like that. Yeah. If so from this article, Ulrich says that perception is not the same as imagining, even though they both involve the same process. Perception is the cyclic interaction with the world, but imagining it only involves the single phase of interactions. So let's move to computer science. So I think that what Ulrich says is something similar with the supervised machine learning. And during training, the machine would construct the schemata. And the schemata would, in work, for example, in neural network, it would be the weight of each feature in the neural network. And they would base on the schemata that predict the outcomes, and then match with the given outcome. If the outcome predict, the previous outcome is incorrect, then they would go back to the schemata and change the schemata and iterate again until they finish training. But the, but we always say that the machine learning is not as intelligent as human is because the schemata does not reflect the real world complexity. Uh, the schemata of the machine is just contains certain features which have been converted into numbers. So they don't reason like human do. When they reason, they just reason over the numbers instead of the real world. But the machine learning is very useful in some specific tasks. So for example, like this research team from Stanford University, they use this anticipation concept to, to build a classifier that can anticipate the driver's manually. So the, they term the project as pen forecast because when they anticipate the driver's manually, when they know that the driver is going to turn right, then they would go and detect whether there is any <coughs> potential danger on the right side. If there is, then they would alert the driver before accident happens. Another application is that they use to build a more intelligent robot. So this, this article, Anticipating Human Activities for Reactive Robotic Responses, they use, they use the anticipating concept when the robot sees that the person is approaching the refrigerator, the, the robot anticipates that you are going to open the freezer and take some food, and it would help you open the freezer. But many times we pass from fridge, but all the time they, you, you can open it. Yeah, so that's, why, that's why the robot the is not intelligent. Yeah, we can, we can say, if we say open the door, mm. if he heard from us, so it's much reasonable. Because we always we has from the fridge. Mm. Yeah, but so it become more intelligent. No, but not affordance wasn't okay. It wasn't. No. What's that affordance thing there? This. No. This. Second. The second. Heat map of object affordances. Heat What's map. that? I think they use the heat map. I think they they can detect whatever is in the environment. Yeah, so when the people go in there, he sees that the people is approaching this heat map instead of that heat map. Mm -hmm. And then they will And what's an affordance? In this this yeah. is the heat. Well, what's an affordance? What is affordance? Mm -hmm. That sorry, I don't know. Okay. So it's an important thing, which is why I I, okay. I, I asked Beth if it was defined in the article. It should have been defined in the article. Um it it, it, it refers to the, the, the opportunities for interacting with that object. So that, that, that this thing here has the affordance of, of sitting, and this 
thing right here has the affordance of walkability, and there's probably some other affordances that you guys can think of. So it's not, it's, it's a representation of the objects, not in terms of a feature, like <clears throat> it's flat, but instead it's sittable. So it's the object is represented in terms of the ways that you interact with it, instead of its, its uh, absolute features. So in the sense that we can interact with the chair yeah. by sitting it. Yeah. So th this is sittable also. Its name is a table, but it's also, it's also sittable. It has the affordance of, 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 of supporting sitting. And I just did it in the hallway so two hours ago. How would you capture this affordance? Uh, that is the question. <laughs> so maybe talk about how affordances relate to the schemas, the schemata. You can do that because you're about to take calls. And why don't you tell him how to how to how we're going to analyze affordances while we're while you're at it? <laughs> so I would suspect that the affordances are maybe the characteristics of your uh, schema, it's where you can move in the space or what your expectations are of um, what could happen. Um. Yeah, you know, uh, when you said, you said that schemas and neural network representations were the same, and I'm like, ooh, that doesn't feel quite right to me. Um, and the reason it doesn't feel right is exactly this reason. Um, the, the neural networks, of course, are only, you know, they're, they're grounded by whatever the input features are. But typically, they are things like, you know, flat and, and slanted and, you know, dark and light and whatever. And a, um, a representation of, in terms of affordance isn't at that level of analysis. It is um, in terms of all of the dimensions that you could use to interact with that object. So the affordances of, of this table and this chair are different for me than they are for a three-year-old, right? Because this is not suitable for a three-year-old. I know a three-year-old. It's not suitable for that three-year-old. <laughs> um, so, so it's an interpretation of the world, not in terms of its absolute features, but in terms of, of your interactions with it. And the interactions are part of schemas. And that seems to be missing from your typical neural network model. It's not that it couldn't be there. You just would have to represent the features in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's why I said that it's, it does not reflect the real complexity. It's not so much complexity. It's that it's, it's who is it that's interacting with this thing. Mm. So a three-year-old interacts with this environment differently than I do, <laughs> differently than a geriatric person. It, you know, this is suitable for me. It may not be suitable for me in, in 20 years. So you would actually represent the environment differently, rather than represent the environment and then represent the agent separately and then figure out how they interact. And so this is really important for robotics. You actually do want the environment represented in, in a manner that indicates how the robot can interact with that environment. I don't know if you had a chance to say, I'm sorry, it was late, um, that NICER um, was at Cornell. Did you did you mention that? Nicer. Not well, Ulrich or, or Nicer. I'm, I'm not on first name basis with him, so I. <laughs> oh, Nicer, which is the author of this the, this paper, um, and um, and Nicer's colleague was Jimmy Gibson, and Jimmy Gibson is sort of the perceptual side of this whole ecological psychology movement, where this point about affordances is more explicit. So you so nicer is sort of the cognitive guy, and Gibson also is this, is it's called nicer cycle of perception. Yeah, nicer. Yeah. No, but it's called his cycle of perception. Yeah. Right? Well, yes, but but you still in the community of practice, hmm. nicer is the cog the co more cognitively <coughs> oriented guy who tried to figure out how cognition and thought played a role here. He he, but he definitely was influenced by Gibson in terms of you know how, how we should think about perception as a perception action cycle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the Cornell psychology view. So Gibson has different view because I No, it's they're very similar. It's just that it's just like two sides of the same coin. So nicer is going to be more worried about the the schemas and, and memory kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. But he's also going to be worried about perception. 
borrowing from Gibson, and borrowing from Gibson the notion of affordances, and borrowing from Gibson the notion that perception is coupled with action. So, so they go together. I, I miss this is a, you know, when we talk about like really big psychologists and big important people, Gibson and Nicer would certainly be, you know, two that in a hundred years they're still going to be in the, in, in, the, in the psych textbooks. Now there's no reason, there's, this is not an incompatible view with computer science, and I think that robotics definitely takes a sort of Gibsonian perspective in, in mind. But I do kind of worry about you know, thinking about neural networks in this way. You have to represent the features. The low-level features, input features, have to be in terms of affordances. Not, not this is flat and you know, so many feet off the table, off the floor, and what, whatever. Well, there are two different things. One is that this is flat, but and that's that's one type of feature. The other thing is that you can sit on it. That's another level of thing, yeah. so, which is at a high level of abstraction. Right. It is also more contextual. Yes. I mean, it's flat, and that remains true for all the time. Uh, but um, you know, you can sit on it. It's more contextual. Uh, sit for uh, adult and not for a child. Right. It depends on the agent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so up in the higher levels of, uh, in the interior of the, of the network is what you're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first, in the first layer, you say very high level feature, for instance, um, is it a chair? And then next level, you check that, that does it have leg? I mean, does it have... I mean, ah, but see, lots of things are sitable that aren't like that. Rocks. Is it... Boxes. Uh, every time you start to give me a feature definition for a schema, I can t I can give you an example of something that doesn't meet that that still is a sitable thing, and that's that's the challenge. That's what so, Hussein was saying. So how do you recover these? That's a big yeah, problem. I mean, that's how to define sitability. Yeah, exactly. I think they have the same, uh, the same idea that you said about affordances. They come from Cornell. Yeah. So I looked up one of them, yeah. but it's the yeah, same so definitions. Yeah. Cornell is the, is the place where this, the, the birthplace of this. I thought affordances was Gibson. <laughs> it is. That's but why maybe it's not. That's Cornell. Yeah. So I think this is the end of my slide. Yeah. So I remember Dr. Chef is in his integral state that there are two things that we can't build right now, intuition and perceptual with anticipation. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we should uh, bring in uh, you know, the stuff that I had pointed out, uh, the work at uh, this guy at Cornell, and Sta then he went to Stanford, and the PhD guy, uh, the robo brain, and those, that, that mm -hmm. guy, right? And so um, I think there's some interesting things as you see it is one thing that you see from the viewpoint of psychology, and it becomes um, inspiration. But when we try to develop computational things, it's never verbatim. It's never, it's, it's never you know, there, there's not uh, a, um, exact replication. At least that is what I believe. So if some people are trying to create brain uh, on a chip, but that doesn't mean that brain on you know, a chip will behave or think in the same way as human would do. Even if you claim that that brain of the chip has the same computational thing, because then, okay, you got a brain on the chip, but uh, that doesn't mean you understand the processes that happen in the brain and the, and, and the pathways that we have in the brain and the way that, you know, the, the, there is no way to do uh, wiring, uh, assume that the wiring in the, on the chip will be exactly the same way the brain wiring does, because, uh, for example, you create a, say, oh, this chip is uh, really the IBM chip I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but, you know, think about every one of us uh, are different. And we are going to be, you know, because of our whole life experiences from our childhood um, and how our wiring happens in the brain. Uh, so at the best, you can say that this will be one example, you know, I can possibly train one human on that chip, uh, creating so many. Um, and, and, uh, and then there are other things, right? Well, can the machines love? Uh, and many other things that you have to ask uh, that we don't know if machines can do it, right? What does it mean for 
machines to love. We saw that video that uh, Nini had uh, put to, uh, uh, yeah, that the uh, arranged right for that that thing where this uh, this machine that you know uh, kind of uh, is a human or, or behaves as a human, right? Uh, the human becomes in fact uh, so much emotionally attached to the machine, and machine actually makes him think that uh, you know she is attached, but then. But then, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing was at the end, she says goodbye, <laughs> you know, I had a rethinking, you know. Uh, it actually happens, uh, you know, people break up the same way, perhaps, I don't know. But, um, so... She, she had the 600 users. Yeah, so, 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 so it, it's, you know, the, this guy found out that, no, there's no exclusive relationship. <laughs> that machine did not have an exclusive relationship. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, uh, so the point is that um, you know that best we can uh, you know take uh, inspiration and then we need to really think originally as to you know and I think um, I will prefer far more a purely software approach and loosely understanding and trying to create right now before we try to you know faithfully try create brain right um, and in that particular context uh, that thing was interesting like okay here is uh, they created a knowledge base by observing human inter robots interaction with the environment right so you are observing uh, a lot of things and from that you or, or you can observe human um, uh, interaction with the environment let's say how do you make a coffee and that knowledge base was used to uh, allow to to help um, a robot mm -hmm. learn or try to actually uh, uh, do uh, you know the task of making a coffee right um, and the, 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 you know the interesting thing is that now you have two different steps. You you have a step of learning from human uh, interactions, and then you try, you have an attempt of doing this. But you're not saying that it will be just the same natural is as natural as the human interaction with the um, environment. It is not the same as that the machine will be able to do all the same error corrections. It is not the same that uh, how um, the human decides on a particular time of the day. Uh, I today I want this flavor coffee and not the other flavor coffee, right? So in um, uh, how you know, so machine can make a coffee, but that doesn't really solve the human need, right? The human need would be that can the machine make the coffee that human wants? But then well, you don't even know ahead of the time what the human wants and what influences the human's choice of what coffee you're going to make, right? So so yeah, you you know, you're saying you're trying to do something like a human, but it's really far if you think about it. If this is a mechanical task of making a coffee. is very different than serving human a coffee that human wants at that particular time. Right? Because so, of the senses, the smell. It taste. may be senses or um, the guy uh, says, today I am in a meet, uh, you know, mood for dark roast because X, Y, Z. Or or I had a little bit more stress today and I want stronger coffee. Now, how is the machine going to really, for that is yet another uh, three orders of magnitude of data that it will have to have to get that kind of understanding of, you know, how human behaves. So, uh, so that's... Question answering, right? Hmm? Question answering we can give to the machine and you can ask us which kind well, of coffee... Give it your Google calendar. Exactly. No, <laughs> no uh, question answering, right? We can say, okay, which kind of coffee okay how much sugar or not exactly but like a machine but then that is not the same as behaving like a human does yeah. i mean i mean the guy will say uh, my process of actually interacting with this robot to tell robot what I want is more painful than my doing the coffee on my own <laughs> <laughs> right so I, I think there is um, there are some many interesting things that's why uh, simply trying the machine to uh, recreate human uh, you know um, Activity, behavior, all that stuff is, in my view, uh, at least at this point and uh, this decade, doesn't seem all that attractive. Uh, of course, as a researcher, we want to learn. Uh, we're making machine more smart, but I think I have. Uh, I think I think there's more to gain by taking the loose inspiration and try to create. Just like in anything we do, right? I mean, in algorithm, we have greedy algorithm. Break down the things in the part and then build the things. In um, in general, in most computer architecture, we divide the things in set of components and figure out different ways the component will interact. And that intelligence really will not come from the nodes or the component, will come from the interactions a lot more. Right? 
And the why? I think a number of people do understand this. So it's nothing that I'm, I'm not saying something very unique. There are a lot of intelligences through the uh, wiring, and, and the other thing is the wiring is not fixed in the brain, right? The wiring is highly dynamic, right? So, so it actually is decided on the context, on the spur. We don't understand that. If we don't understand, you have all this bunch of neurons, you already known pathways, uh, and yet we don't know, um, you know, which one will take precedence at what time. We don't know whether the uh, visual sense will take over and drive this particular activity or whether it is the uh, you know, auditory sense. It's like the you know, will me make would me would would the sound make me more uh, pay, pay more attention or a visual cue will pay 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 me more attention? Uh, we don't know. It is contextual. It is at that time. It is what I'm doing now versus you know what I already anticipated to be there. It is not um, you know, if it's a, a unknown a, a, a voice, I'll pay attention. So it is not just a voice that will uh, I'll pay attention. It is if it's unknown, I'll pay attention. To, you know. So, so these level of complexity are very dynamic in nature, very contextual in nature. Those are the challenging things, understanding them and you know, doing it on the fly, those are the important things. And nothing that you can hardwire and uh, you know, pre-plan is going to work in this kind of context. All right, anything else? No. All right, fantastic.